Okay, so in the morning session, I, I went through most of uh, sort of the broad phenomenology of glasses that I meant to cover. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the last thing I was talking about was aging uh, near the glass uh, transition. And um, now, in the rest of what I had planned, uh, you know, because in the morning, I was sort of going back and forth asking you questions. I didn't get to as much of what I had planned as possible. So I'll try to make up a little bit of time. Uh, so I'll, I'll sort of not be asking you questions. And, and uh, huh? uh, no, but then they take a lot of time. Huh? Less <laughs> No, no, I'm saying, so what I was going to say is, therefore, they should stop me and ask me questions, right? No, I won't be asking them questions, but they can ask me questions, right? Right, yeah. So, um, and the other thing is, uh, I will skip some material which I think is not essential to go through. Uh, so I'll sort of tell you the, the summary of it. So if there's any confusion, you can stop me and then. All right, so we, we basically stopped here, where we said, uh, if, I, if I have a system that's aging, uh, what that means is that the, not only the properties of the system, such as the volume, uh, a function of time, but also the dynamical response of the system changes uh, with, the, with the amount of aging. Okay. Um, so there's something very, uh, of interesting and, and uh, important that's associated uh, with this kind of behavior, which I want to go through. And in order to do that, I want to first give you a very quick uh, summary of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And, uh, and you'll see why that, that's, that comes in at this point of the story. And also, this gives us a good way to start talking about uh, description of dynamics. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so now, if I have a system where I have a bare Hamiltonian and I, and I now impose an external field E, which couples to some observable, uh, which is a function of the coordinates of the system, which we call M here, uh, then the perturbed Hamiltonian can be written in this way. And when that happens, um, you expect that in equilibrium, various properties will change, right? So in particular, you, if, if, this variable itself, m, uh, had a zero expectation value in the unperturbed case, you expect that it will now acquire a finite, uh, finite value. And uh, that finite value, I can write in the limit in, in uh, well, <coughs> this can be written as a susceptibility times the applied external field. Okay, so at least we're talking about linear uh, response of the system. And this susceptibility in turn can be written as the inverse temperature time times this uh, equal time correlation function of the variable m. Right, this is something that you've seen uh, that. Uh, if, if I think of this as a magnetization, the magnetic susceptibility can be written as uh, uh, the, the correlation function of the magnetization. And uh, now, instead of, this is the static case to have as a reference, it's something that's familiar. Now, if we consider instead that we have a time-dependent field E, okay, uh, in the limit of the response of the system being linear, uh, linear response theory tells you, and I'm not going to say anything more, that the time-dependent response or the value of the observable m as a function of time is given by this integral here, where I have, like before, the external field, but instead of the susceptibility here, I have a correlation function of the variable m times the time derivative of m at an earlier time. Okay? So this... Um, uh, of course, uh, I can rewrite this in various ways to make it more familiar, uh, 
uh, one thing I can do is to say the correlation function, I'm going to call something. This is called a response function as beta times the correlation function. And now this is sort of looking very similar to this, right? And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, if I take the limit t going to infinity and I imagine that my field is a constant field, right? That the time dependence comes only in me turning it on at some particular time, then I can take it out of the integral and uh, then uh, what I'm left with is the integral of this phi, okay, from zero to infinity, and this integral now is uh, identifiable with the static susceptibility, okay? So, um, so you have, uh, the, in the static case, the response of the system is contained in the susceptibility. Now we sort of define it in two steps. We have a response function phi whose integral uh, gives me the susceptibility, which I can also define uh, up to some particular time, right? So I can define an integral chi uh, t t prime as an integral from t prime to t of this, I'm sorry, the, no, uh, I think it's okay, uh, of the response function uh, defined like this. Now, <coughs> this, of course, is the same as saying that the derivative of the susceptibility is this response function. And if I go back here, what I had here was a relation that said that the response function was equal to this time correlation function, mm dot, right? And this mm dot, I can write as the time derivative of the correlation of m at two different times. I get a minus sign because of on which which of the m's I have the time derivative. Okay, so the result is d chi dt is equal to minus 1 over kbt and that the time derivative of the correlation function m m. Okay. Is that is that okay? So this is a one way of writing the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And uh, I can also sort of consider an integral form of this, where I take the integral on both sides, and the chi at the same time, if I take t prime, t prime, uh, it's zero, okay? Um, um, so that allows me to write my chi at t, t prime as uh, the integral of the right-hand side, which is the derivative of the correlation function and I have c at, at the same time minus c t t prime, okay? Now, um, this starts out at time t equal to zero by being uh, the same as this guy, and then it decays to zero, right, in equilibrium systems, and therefore at long times, I'm left with this quantity here, okay? the equal time correlation of M, and that was the static susceptibility. So everything is okay, yeah? Um, so this is now, uh, what this version of the fluctuation dissipation theorem tells me is that if I were to plot this susceptibility on the y-axis and the correlation function on the x-axis, I should get something with a negative slope where the slope is the inverse of the temperature, okay? And that is a test, if you will, of the system being in equilibrium, yeah? And uh, so uh, all of this uh, to say that, in fact, in aging systems, uh, this doesn't work, right? So this fluctuation dissipation uh, relation is violated in aging systems, and this is sort of uh, an important and interesting uh, observation. Um, but before I turn the slide, is this all clear to everybody? Yeah? yeah. So there, there's sort of many things that are going on here. Uh, one of the things is that even though I didn't emphasize it up to now, we have introduced time correlation functions as an important quantity to, to study, right? When we're looking at the response of a system through a external perturbation, right? And, and that, in what follows, I'm going to assume uh, is obvious, 
right? That, that we should be looking at time correlation functions as a, an important way of characterizing how a system might respond to external events. Yeah? Okay. So, how, what does happen uh, for aging systems uh, is illustrated here, where I plot temperature times the susceptibility uh, against the correlation function. So in time, I start out here, where the correlation function is 1, right? I, it's been normalized properly, uh, and the susceptibility is 0, right? So as time goes on, I go on this axis, sorry, on this line, where I'm now, my correlation is decreasing, my susceptibility is building up, right? And the slope that is marked here is a, a negative unit slope, right? Because I multiplied the temperature here, okay? And, and so if the system was in equilibrium, uh, that the entire data set would lie on that curve. Okay, and um, what one sees instead is that at, at small values of correlations, uh, there are deviations, okay? And uh, <clears throat> so this is a hallmark of the, uh, of aging, of the system not being in equilibrium, but it's also interesting that there is sort of a separation of two regimes where the, the fluctuation dissipation theorem holds and, and does not hold, which points to the idea that there is some limited sense in which thermalization is always present, but there are other degrees of freedom which are not thermalized, and when that is the case, one can think of uh, perhaps expressing the behavior here uh, in terms of an effective temperature, okay, that, that I imagine that there is, the, the therm the, what the thermometer measures is a good enough temperature for the behavior at, at, at short times, but the behavior at long times is governed instead by some other effective temperature, etc., uh, etc. Et I'm not going to go into all this because that, that takes a lot of uh, time to properly discuss, but this is just to sort of tell you that, uh, yeah. Yeah, higher or lower temperature? So when, when I have the FDT violation here, is the temperature higher or lower? Huh? Really? Good. There are only two possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, the slope is lower, right? But the temperature is sitting here, right? So it's actually a higher temperature. Okay, yeah. These are different wave vector values. They're, they're labeled by different K, right? So, um, <coughs> if you ask me more details about what this system is, I, I don't remember, okay? But, the, but what you're asking, uh, Well, so, yeah. well, so the story is a little bit more complicated than that, right? Um, because the idea of having a single slope here is, is only one of the possibilities, okay? So, but uh, you're right, if, if I imagine that there's just one effective temperature, then if I were to look at different observables, uh, for it to make sense, uh, the slopes should be the same. And, and in this case, they are. <clears throat> 
Right. Yeah. So what what is different is what? Okay. No, I mean, but whatever you ask, is, is, is addressed or no? No. So, if I, it, it could be that I am a co-author of that paper. <laughs> I'm not very sure. Uh, and uh, just in case I was, uh, <laughs> it was tried with two different types of particles, mm -hmm. and then again, it coincides rather well. So, so to the extent that you believe in the straight lines to guide the eye, uh, it sort of works. Yeah. Okay. But we leave this here. And uh, so, I mean, I, I, I sort of uh, put that dis even that much discussion of the aging behavior because we're really not coming back to talk about it. Uh, so I, I thought, let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, and like I said, this is also a good way to start talking about dynamics. Okay. But now, before we continue, uh, so far, I haven't, you know, sort of to throw a bunch of uh, sort of facts about glossy behavior. And here is sort of a summary. Okay. What's clear so far is that we're dealing with disordered systems in the relevant range, viscosity and other properties increase dramatically, glasses form as a result of the liquid falling out of equilibrium, and the glasses that we form depend on kinetic factors. Uh, we have interesting relaxation effects around the glass transition temperature, and I, I said it earlier, interesting low temperature properties, and uh, the excess entropy sort of shows some peculiar behavior, suggesting a possible transition. Okay, so none of this is very definitive so far, right? So there are a number of questions, right? Uh, things that are not clear at this stage. So what is the type of disorder we're talking about? Uh, is there a thermodynamic transition? Uh, what is the nature of the dynamics approaching the transition? Uh, out of equilibrium dynamics. Are the dynamical aspects related intimately to the thermodynamic transition that may exist? What's the physical picture? So this is sort of a bunch of questions uh, to think about when one is uh, sort of trying to understand glassy behavior, okay? Um, so I'll quickly go through points that we don't really uh, need to have a very uh, detailed discussion of. So in terms of the types of disorder, uh, the basic uh, d distinction to make is uh, what is called annealed versus quenched disorder, right? So um, <clears throat> so the um, uh, the disorder that you have in in, in a glass forming system uh, is is what is called annealed or self generated disorder, because if you look at you know if you if you write down the Hamiltonian for the system, there's nothing in it that that is disordered, right? It's it's uh, you have a sum of pairwise interactions. Um, so what Disorder you may see in the structure or of, of the system is something that arises, right? Um, this is to be contrasted with uh, systems uh, which are characterized by quenched disorder, where the disorder is somehow imposed on the, the system from the outside, okay? So when we say the system, we, we have in mind some set of degrees of freedom, right? Uh, so... Uh, the classic example, which we will talk a little bit more about, are spin glasses, where I have uh, the set of spins, which are my degrees of freedom, and they interact through some Hamiltonian. In a non-disordered system, the Hamiltonian has nearest neighbor couplings, let's say all of which are ferromagnetic, but in a spin glass system, these spins are sort of distributed uh, at, at uh, random points in the in the system, and uh, because of everything else that's going on in the system with electrons and so on, which I'm not worrying about, uh, if I look at any pair of spins, the interactions may be randomly positive or negative, but for a given pair, they remain so. Okay, they they don't change with time. 
So this is a quench disorder, right? So, um, <clears throat> okay, so what we, we're dealing with anil disorder and, and, and in, in, in a lot of thinking about the glass problem, when you come from understanding well the behavior of systems with quench disorder, uh, sort of a mystery is how very similar behavior becomes manifest in a system that doesn't have quench disorder. Um, okay, so now this is something I'm going to, it's already been covered by Chandan. Uh, in terms of the liquid structure, we, when we say it's disordered, uh, one of the things we mean is that it doesn't have any long range order, right? And this is uh, apparent in the pair correlation function uh, or the structure factor, which is the Fourier transform of it. Uh, you've already seen and heard that. So let, let's move on. So now coming to dynamics, um, <clears throat> like I said, from the discussion of, of the linear response of, of the system, it's already clear that in order to understand how a system responds to external uh, fields, uh, I mean, somewhat unexpectedly, uh, uh, one could say, uh, it turns out that uh, Autocorrelation functions of, of uh, variables in the system are relevant, okay? And, and uh, that's what the fluctuation dispersion theorem tells you. Um, so what are the variables that one would normally think about when one is discussing a liquid, right? So there, I've written some symbol M, and I didn't, I didn't tell you what they are, that symbol was. And uh, so um, a lot of... Uh, discussion uh, uh, in, in, in sort of in, in what follows uh, will implicitly or otherwise focus on what are called slow modes, right? Modes that uh, decay or, or change slowly. And these are also called hydrodynamic modes. And uh, I won't go into uh, a lot of discussion of it, but. Uh, one example, which I will describe in some detail, is uh, the, dense, the local density of a liquid, right? So you know that a liquid has an equilibrium average density that is constant, right? But I can imagine that uh, in some particular instant of time, there is some fluctuation away from that constant value, right? And then I can ask, how does that fluctuation change with time, okay? And uh, now, because density fluctuations can go away, uh, why actually, you know, sort of particles moving, right? So the mass is a conserved quantity, and, and so you can't just sort of make it disappear. If I decrease the density fluctuation in some part, that has to involve the movement of particles elsewhere, right? And therefore, um, these modes, if I'm looking at long wavelength fluctuations, uh, take longer and longer to relax, the longer the wavelength is, okay? Uh, so uh, we're going to be thinking about such modes, okay? I won't tell you more along those lines, uh, but if I wanted to now uh, start uh, defining you know, and talk about these density fluctuations, what I want is a space and time dependent field, right, that describes the density fluctuations in the system, yeah? And, and so uh, I can uh, talk about it in many different ways, but the simplest way to define a field, at least formally, is to do what I've done here, which is to say that the density at r comma t is given by the sum over all the particles I have in the system uh, with a delta function at the position of each of the particles, okay, at a given time, t, okay? Now, of course, uh, in reality, this will not give you a smooth field, right? You'll have a bunch of delta functions, but then you can imagine that I take this field and I do some suitable forms of coarse graining, et cetera, to get a smooth uh, field with which I can work with. We won't go into all of that, right? This is good enough for now, right? And uh, one thing that's commonly done 
indeed, as I'm talking right now, uh, is not to talk about the real space uh, version of these fields, but to, to talk about Fourier components. Right? This is something we do uh, all the time. And so the Fourier transform of this is, you know, if you, you can see very clearly, simply given by the sum over all the particles, well, because this is a delta function, I just get the exponential of i k dot r i of t. Okay? He agrees. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, okay. Now, given that rho k of t, I can ask, can I now build a density, uh, sorry, a time correlation function of this, right? And that time correlation function uh, is uh, written here. It's called the intermediate scattering function. And, and the reason uh, I'll tell you in a minute. And uh, so normally, when you have complex variables, uh, when you define correlation functions, uh, you define them as expectation values of A star, A co complex conjugate A. And so here, uh, I want to take the, the time correlation function of rho of k at time 0 uh, times rho of k at time t. And uh, the rho of k at time t is here. Rho of k at time 0, complex conjugate gives me a minus k. So this is now um, the intermediate scattering function. And this is related to many other familiar things that uh, you, 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 you know. Uh, one is, if I put this t equal to 0, I get another quantity that I mentioned a few slides ago. Does anyone know? Or can anyone tell me? Huh? The static structure factor, it's called, right? The Fourier transform of the pair correlation function. Now. If I take, in addition to the space Fourier transform, also a time Fourier transform, right? Then I get what is called, by the same token, the dynamic structure factor, right? And the dynamic structure factor is something that you measure in frequency resolved scattering experiments, right? And, and so the frequency dependence is something that, that tells you about the dynamics. And because this is sort of halfway between, I guess, it's called the intermediate scattering function. Okay? Um, okay. Now, <coughs> um, I can also not look at this whole uh, quantity. Huh? Uh, I, uh, you know, it, I didn't emphasize, but if I expand these uh, densities out, these come out as a double sum, right? But then I can say that, um, you know, I'm not interested in this collective quantity, but I just want to look at single particles and look at how they move around, right? And then uh, I can, instead of this double sum, I can just work with a single sum here, right? I mean, I have to define a corresponding density variable, etc. but it's trivial enough. And, and uh, so this quantity is called the self part of the intermediate scattering function, okay? And uh, this is, again, something that is or, or the Fourier transform of this, which is the self dynamic scattering, uh, dynamic structure factor, is something that is measurable. You have to play some tricks, but, okay, it's a measurable quantity, and, and it gives you useful information. <laughs> okay, so how does this correlation function look? Okay. So here is a schematic of how this, this uh, structure factor might look. Um, and, and, and so, you know, one usually normalizes, uh, sorry, I said something wrong, how this correlation function might look. So one usually normalizes it to, you know, to 1 at time 0. And so you have these correlation functions go from 1 to 0. And, and they go in, in, uh, uh, in a manner that, that's typical that's sketched here uh, for, for glass forming liquids, where note that I'm looking at the logarithm of time on the x axis. And so, what I normally have is a short time uh, relaxation that is fast. And this is assumed to, I mean, it's, it's not only assumed, but we, we know, uh, comes from uh, sort of vibrational motion. Okay, this is called the microscopic regime. And then you have uh, sort of oscillatory behavior 
at short times, um, uh, which, which is uh, referred to as the boson peak regime. And those of you who were uh, here for uh, Mizuno's talk uh, will, will have heard uh, something about this. And then you have a plateau, you know, so the, 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 this function doesn't continue to decay, but it sort of plateaus out for uh, intermediate windows of time, and, and then eventually decays, okay? So this long time decay is called alpha relaxation, and uh, is characterized by, by some time constant, okay? So the time constant is called the alpha relaxation time, and, uh, and, and the long time part can be described by a famous uh, functional form called the stretched exponential form. So it's slower than exponential, okay? And the stretching exponent beta, and there's a bracket missing here, um, is usually less, you know, well, it is less than one uh, in order for it to call, be called stretched exponential. And uh, it sort of, uh, the smaller it is, the more stretched the behavior is, okay? Um, and this is some uh, data from computer simulations uh, <coughs> where, again, you see that there is sort of a whole range of, this is for the Cobanderson binary Leonard Jones system. Uh, there's a whole range of uh, temperatures from very high to rather low. And you, you see that uh, for high temperatures, this behavior is, is sort of single, it's a single curve, it's, uh, you know, um, not remarkable, but as you go to low temperatures, A, you go from a relaxation time of order one to a relaxation time of order 10 to the four to five. Okay, so in this window of temperatures, the relaxation time, you know how to read off, how did I read off the relaxation time? One over E, right? So if, if, I, if I say that, I have a simple, or actually even if I have a stretched exponential relaxation, <coughs> the correlation function decays to one over E uh, at the relaxation time, right? And that's true if it is stretched exponential all the way from one. That's not quite the case here, but that just to uh, eyeball uh, the relaxation time, you just draw a line here, and that, that's, that's relaxation time, right? So, um, okay. So at low temperatures, all the features, more or less, of what I tell, told you are, are, are visible. Okay, um, I'll skip this. Um, <clears throat> okay, now um, there's another important function, which is related to the intermediate scattering function that uh, people look at, which is called the Van Hover correlation function, which is basically transforming back into real space of the intermediate scattering function. Okay, so uh, if I ask the question, uh, if I had a certain uh, <laughs> density of particles at a, at, at a given position at time t, you know, what's, what, is, um, <clears throat> what is the distribution of those particles at a later time? Uh, it's simpler to say when I talk about a single uh, the self part of the Van Hover correlation function. Uh, this is the formal expression where it's a sum of delta functions r minus ri of t minus ri of zero. Uh, and this is simply asking the question, uh, what is the probability that a particle has moved by a distance r in time t? Okay. Um, and uh, this is the Fourier transform back of the self-intermediate scattering function, and this is the Fourier transform back of the uh, intermediate scattering function, okay? Um, now, if I, if I take this quantity for a moment, <clears throat> the self part, uh, there's one problem which all of you have studied where you know what it looks like, right? Uh, can you tell me? So the probability that in time t I have moved a distance r is a question that you have studied in what context that is on the slides? Huh? <laughs> and the question. <laughs> so it's the awake or not quite. Uh, 
So, really, what problem? That is on the slide. Let's mention other slides. Huh? Brownian motion, diffusion, great. Right? Uh, and so there you know what the... So you are... You knew, and you were looking at the answer. Oh, you can do. <laughs> okay, so there you know that the 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 uh, Van Hover function has a Gaussian form, right? Where if I now take this as a probability distribution, I compute the second moment, the mean squared displacement, as a function of time. Uh, it's linear, and the slope gives me the diffusion coefficient. Okay. So the question is, do we have the same behavior in the case of liquids? And the answer is, at long times, you do. Right? At intermediate times, you have funkier behavior. Okay? Uh, so what does it look like? Uh, if this was a form, right? if I looked at the mean squared displacement, it should just be a, a single curve, which is linear. Right? Uh, but uh, if we look at what you really find, uh, again, for the same set of uh, simulations, I believe, what you find is, you know, there, there's a short time regime where the slope is 2. So r squared goes as t squared. Yeah? And uh, what is that called? Ballistic motion, right? So if I, I just keep moving in the same direction. So the displacement is proportional to time. The displacement squared is proportional to t squared. And, and then, at long times, I've shown here, the slope is 1. And so all the cases from high temperature to low temperature, you're reaching that slope 1. Okay? And that's the diffusive regime. But there is this interesting regime in between where I have a plateau in the mean squared displacement uh, corresponding to the plateau that I saw in the uh, intermediate scattering function. Okay? And, and this is... Uh, a regime where people say the particles are caged and there are various other words to use. Um, but this is how it looks, okay? And uh, we'll come back to this in a minute. Now, clearly, uh, this whole behavior uh, is not uh, at least obviously uh, corresponding to this Gaussian Van Hover function, right? So uh, there was a lot of detail in that slide which I'm going to skip. But, the, but I can define a parameter that tells me uh, how non-Gaussian my Van Hover function is, right? So how would I do that if, if you know, I was just looking at this expression, right? <clears throat> so what is the quantity that, that's sort of zero if everything is, you know, what can I think of which would be zero if the distribution was Gaussian and if it, it would be something finite if it was not? Hmm? No. Yeah. So you know that in the in the case of a Gaussian, uh, the the higher moments are related to the second moment, right? And therefore, I can construct a suitable ratio, uh, and 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 so the fourth moment is the with some numbers in front, the four, second moment squared, right? So I can ask if for my system this relationship is valid, right? To the extent that it's not valid, I get a number that says this is how non-Gaussian your distribution is, right? And I can define this at any given time, yeah? So here is that quantity, okay, all this stuff I'll skip. This is the, called the non-Gaussian parameter, obviously, uh, and it is defined in terms of the fourth moment to the second moment squared ratio, and, uh, and it's a function of time. Yeah? So what should we expect this quantity to behave like based on what I showed here? So why should it increase? Okay, 
I'll take that. Um, <laughs> you know, he said, to paraphrase a little bit, that when the system gets caged, it will deviate from Gaussian behavior, but eventually when, when it goes back to diffusive behavior, you go back to Gaussian, right? So, um, so therefore, I can expect that it will have some non-monotonic behavior, which you do find, right? And uh, the, there's a peak, there's a time at which the non-Gaussian parameter is a maximum, and that time keeps going up and up and up, right? Uh, one might be tempted to think that this is somehow telling me the alpha relaxation time, which would not be a bad guess, but it turns out not to be the case, right? So it, it turns out that the alpha relaxation time and the diffusion time that I might define, I think, oh, oh, oh I know. There are all these funny transitions, which... Uh, need to be aware of. Okay. Um, <coughs> unintended, but uh, so um, what did I say? Anyway, so uh, let me say, uh, why, wh let me just show you how these distributions look like and, and, and why the non-Gaussianity comes, right? Uh, so this is sort of not so obvious but if you look at all of these curves, which are fairly Gaussian, huh? uh, just to confuse, people multiply by R squared so that it's not, you know, it's R squared and then it, it it's, uh, decays as an exponential minus R squared. Uh, but uh, with some training, you can uh, sort of look at these curves and say this is ga looking Gaussian or not. And uh, basically, uh, you know, this is looking pretty Gaussian, but if you go to low and lower temperatures, uh, sorry, uh, if you go to uh, at a low temperature, uh, sometimes, like I think the, the magenta one here, uh, okay, this you can't really see, okay, I'm sorry. Um, but basically, you have a fatter tail than what you expect, okay, and, and I'll, I'll have a clearer picture of that here. Uh, so this is now the solid line is the actual Van Hover function uh, that, that you have uh, in, in these intermediate times. And, and uh, the dotted line is a Gaussian function with the same mean squared value of R. Okay? So in other words, if for the given R squared, uh, if, if I had a Gaussian distribution, it would look like the dotted line. But what it looks is, in fact, something that deviates from that Gaussian, both at small r and at large r, which, of course, compensate each other to give you the same uh, mean squared displacement. Um, <clears throat> and you notice that there is this long, slowly decaying tail. Okay? And um, so these particles that contribute to this long tail are called mobile particles because they're moving faster than you expect, right? And uh, one interesting observation is if I look at these particles now and ask where are they in space, are they randomly placed or are they spatially correlated somehow, right? <coughs> um, what would be your expectation? Hmm? Random. <laughs> okay. What, it, what would be the basis for either expectation, right? Why, would, why might you think that they're spatially correlated? So. Okay, uh, so one thing that's sort of not obvious from anything I've said, is that these are actually very dense systems, right? They're particles not very far away from any particle, right? So, okay, so the, um, <clears throat> now we can sort of imagine two situations where moving by a certain distance is easy, right? And then uh, you sort of say, you know, particles are, will be moving everywhere, right? I, I don't expect there to be any correlation. But if it becomes 
difficult for particles to move because of the presence of all these other particles, right? One may expect that there is some kind of cooperativity that is needed in order for indi individual particles to move. And then one might also expect, this is of course hand waving, uh, that when one particle moves, it creates the possibility for another particle to move in tow. Right? So you may expect that uh, motion of particles is spatially correlated. And the, yeah? Well, if, if, you know, if I, like I said, if, if, uh, if it's easy enough for particles to diffuse, then uh, nothing special needs to happen, so particles anywhere in the system can be moved. Right? Of course, then you won't have the situation that there is a select population of particles that are... Right? Which are moving a lot. <clears throat> right, right. So, um, good point. Uh, is that clear? If if I had, um, <coughs> so if 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 I, you know, you play this game, you know, where there's one missing uh, square and you keep moving particles, right? So uh, that's basically defect diffusion, and now. Uh, if I had some population of these defects all over my system, which could be distributed randomly, those particles would clearly uh, contribute to the tail, right? So I will pick out a mobile uh, subpopulation, but if I then were to go and look where they were, uh, you know, they, they would be all over the place. There will be no spatial correlation. So that's sort of, but on the other hand, if these defect locations are things that need to be created due to fluctuations in the equilibrium liquid structure, then the situation would be different. That, that uh, a defect that I create for one particle <coughs> for some time that, that may last a finite amount also be available for other particles to move around. Right? So that, that's sort of the intuition for saying that they should be correlated. Okay, so what that tells you is that there is, in different ways that one may speak of, heterogeneous dynamics in the system, okay? Um, and this has consequences, which I will uh, skip, uh, which is of interest to many of us, but we'll, you know, a shortage of time. Uh, but uh, um, let me see, what do I have here? Uh, this is sort of, okay, um, let me just briefly uh, mention, uh, again, I, I won't say too much more about heterogeneity, but I, I think I've sort of con communicated to you the idea that there are specially correlated mobility fields one can think of. You know, this is what you observe, right? Uh, how you explain it is a different question, but <clears throat> once you say that mobility over some time window, right, uh, is, is correlated spatially, then the natural thing to think of is, can I define a length scale with this, right? So, now, just as an analogy, uh, if, if I think of uh, just an ordinary fluid, typically one worries about these things near the critical point, the liquid gas critical point, where the density is very inhomogeneous in space, Right? And this allows me to define two things. It allows me to define a correlation length, right? <clears throat> and it also allows me to define a susceptibility which becomes larger the bigger the correlation length. Right? These two are connected quantities, related quantities. And uh, one may ask, is there an equivalent thing that we can do? Um, for in, in this case, right, where I don't have a density field that I'm talking about, but instead I'm thinking about a mobility field, okay? So the mobility field, uh, just to be clear, is something I define by saying, in a given elapsed time, how much have particles moved, right? So it's a time-dependent mobility field. 
Um, so, uh, so the order parameter, therefore, uh, is a time correlation function itself, right? So I look at, if, I, if I'm looking at some region, I'm looking at it at time zero, and then I'm looking at it at some later time, and I'm asking how much have things moved, right? So that's a two-point correlation function. And then I want to ask, how is the mobility in one place in space correlated with the mobility in another point in space, right? And that also requires two more density fields. So overall, I have four, I have four density fields that I need in order to define a four-point correlation function. Okay, so this is sort of a, a visual picture of what we do, and uh, this is now the corresponding definition. So here, this is the first mobility. Uh, so at time, at position zero, I'm asking how much was the excess density at time zero, and how much was it at time t, right? A density density correlation function at the same point allows me to say infer something about the mobility at that point and then I have at a distant point r I'm asking the same question right and that is a four point uh, density correlation function and this is what is used in order to compute uh, heterogeneity length scale and uh, now, I'm, not, I'm going to skip some details, okay? So this is now a, a four-point function of space and time, right? Um, I can take a Fourier transform, right? Now, in the case of the density-density correlation function in space, um, the Fourier transform gave you, as uh, Susanna said earlier, the structure factor, right? And you might know, but if not, I'm telling you now, that the k going to zero limit of the structure factor gives you the susceptibility, the compressibility in the case of a liquid, right? And, and so similarly here, uh, we can take the Fourier transform of this G4, right? Um, <clears throat> and if we take the k going to zero limit, uh, that gives me a susceptibility, which is called the chi-4 susceptibility, okay? It's a name. And uh, it continues to be a function of time uh, because the mobility field I've defined as a function of the elapsed time. Okay? So chi-4 is also a function of time. Okay? And if I look at what the typical behavior is, uh, it looks like what I showed earlier, which was a non-Gaussian parameter. Right? It, it, it goes up. And, and, and comes down, right? So there's a characteristic time at which the, uh, this chi-4 susceptibility is, is a maximum, okay? In other words, there's a characteristic time at which the dynamics is most spatially heterogeneous, okay? Um, and and uh, again, uh, we observe that this uh, the, the characteristic time, which we call tau 4, is basically the alpha relaxation time that one may define using the same uh, correlation function. Okay? And, and, uh, and this, this uh, tau of alpha, or tau 4, which is, the, which is tau alpha, grows as you go to lower temperatures, and, and the chi 4 at this characteristic time also gets bigger and bigger as I go to lower temperatures, okay? So this value at the peak get, is getting bigger and bigger as I go to low temperatures, and the time at which it, it becomes maximum is also getting bigger and bigger as I go to low temperatures, okay? Um, okay, um, as I had already mentioned, the alpha 2 also is showing this trend. Uh, so you can ask, what is the time at which the the non-Gaussian parameter is speaking, right? And um, it turns out that the time at which the non-Gaussian parameter is maximum is given by the diffusion coefficient, okay? And these two time scales are, are sort of shown in this inset here, that, and, and which shows that the diffusion time has a smaller temperature dependence than the alpha relaxation time, okay? And, uh, 
this has interesting uh, consequences, uh, which, which I won't go into. Okay, but this is, uh, I think, a good. At this point, I'm going to skip because this gets a little heavy. Um, okay. So before I now go on, are there any questions? What is the, why is T star and, and T alpha not the same? Hmm? So, no, so, um, <clears throat> okay, so the part, one part that I skipped in, in what I, uh, I'm, I'm talking about is um, <clears throat> that the, you know, uh, these are manifestations of, uh, breakdown of the stokes einstein relation. So usually you, you take the diffusion coefficient as defining a characteristic time, which you believe is proportional to the viscosity. Okay? And that uh, is not true at, at low temperatures. Uh, and, and, and so um, the diffusion coefficient is a uh, bigger than what you might expect by using the stokes einstein relation. Yeah? And uh, there's sort of ways of thinking about it um, to relate that to heterogeneous dynamics. Okay? But uh, let me stop there on that topic because uh, I have uh, half an hour and some slides to go. Okay? Uh, because I, so far, I've, 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 as I'm by and large supposed to, I've, I've, I'm telling you phenomenology, you know, these are things that we observe, you know, this is so, up to now, even the stuff on dynamical heterogeneity, I'm just reporting to you what we observe, right? Um, so now I want to spend a little bit of time uh, to tell you about a couple of directions in which uh, people have... Uh, uh, investigated to try and understand uh, all of this behavior. Okay? And uh, so the first uh, sort of um, attempt, not the first attempt historically, but uh, you know, uh, first thing that I'm going to tell you about is uh, a way of building on sort of standard liquid state theory of dynamics and, and to sort of try and write down equations for uh, the time dependence of correlation functions and, and see how far you can get, okay? And, and uh, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so the one thing I mentioned is. Hmm? Okay. So I, I won't say what, but the t dependence of viscosity, relaxation, time. That's it. So this is one thing. Um, <clears throat> the second thing is. Uh, this is stretched exponential, so I'm just, I'm, I'm going to write phi of t, which, which is uh, uh, any time correlation. We've talked about the density correlation function. And the third thing is. So these are related, but uh, okay. Whether so there's a divergence temperature, okay. Um, so let me just leave it there because if I add more things, 
that will not be pertinent to this part, okay, but we'll, we'll add a few more points to that list, yeah. Say, the, say that again. Except, uh, that's sort of implicit there, but okay. Okay. I mean, among the things that I've mentioned, um, and 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 uh, okay, yeah, I, I think that's that's uh, <coughs> okay. So um, now, okay, this is now like a really uh, this needs a lot of time, but I, I let me just sort of give you a a quick summary of what one tries to do, right? As I already said, uh, you, fo you focus on writing down the dynamics of time correlation functions, and you try to start with the exact microscopic equations of motion, and you try to sort of define what you call slow degrees of freedom, as I said, hydrodynamic modes, uh, and, and fast degrees of freedom, and you have a picture that the fast degrees of freedom somehow just offer a thermal path, okay, to the slow degrees of freedom, so that I can think of then describing the slow degrees of freedom uh, through some form of a Langevin equation, right, which you heard about, okay? And uh, so now the set of slow degrees of freedom obviously have to include things that I'm interested in, right? Uh, but uh, <coughs> everything else, for the time being, are the fast degrees of freedom, okay? And, uh, okay, so, um, like, a, you know, for concreteness, uh, density and, and, and momentum uh, are, are slow degrees of freedom that I'm going to be interested in, right? Uh, so, uh, I, I won't go through all of this, but if I were to write down these microscopic time evolution equations, right, for any, any variable A in, 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 the, in, in the system, subject to Hamiltonian dynamics, I can formally rewrite this equation as um, a generalized Langevin equation, where I have uh, an instantaneous uh, sort of, of spring kind of term, and then I have what is called a memory term, where uh, the time derivative of A depends on what it was before, okay? And this K of tau is called uh, a memory kernel, right? And then there is a random force, like, you know, I normally have when I write down a Langevin equation, okay? So this is uh, a fairly standard Langevin equation, right? Except <clears throat> we have some formal expressions for this memory kernel and the random force. And in particular, the memory kernel is going to be given by the time correlation function of uh, the random force. And that's not actually unfamiliar, right? You, when you wrote down, and when you discuss Brownian motion, the friction that sits in the same place uh, is related to the no noise, right? Just you know. So that's a FBT statement. Okay, skip, <laughs> right? Now, this, uh, if, I, if I, like I said, take my set of variables to be the density and the current uh, variables, right? Now I have basically two first order uh, sets of equations to work with and <clears throat> What I end up with, if I just write uh, at the end of the day uh, an equation for the density density correlation function, is a second order equation. Okay, this is again something that that's a familiar feature. And then the second derivative of f is given by, like I said, uh, a term that uh, you know is proportional to the variable itself. 
uh, incidentally, yeah, so what is one thing that is relevant going from this slide to this is I can take this equation here for the variable A and write a corresponding equation for the time correlation function of the variable A, which I'm going to call C, right? Uh, which looks basically the same except the noise term drops out. Okay? And that's what I'm writing here now uh, for the density density correlation function. Right? Uh, so, and, and <coughs> it has this term, which is the, like I said, the random force correlation term, which, which gives me the memory kernel. And this, in principle, is very difficult to compute. Okay? So what people do under certain approximations, <coughs> and I'll come to, you know, a qualitative statement about it, is to write this quantity in terms of a pair of density correlation functions. Okay? So what you, in fact, <clears throat> okay, so let me just leave it there. So it's a very complicated equation, but at the end of the day, what you have is a second derivative of f, a term that's proportional to f, and a memory integral, which has the time derivative of f multiplied by two correlators, okay? And, and when you have products of these correlation functions, uh, that tells you that different modes will get coupled, okay? And, and that's where the name comes from. And uh, now, okay, so in terms of what behavior of the time correlation function, when you can solve it, uh, you get is, is illustrated here in a simple model, or a, in a, what's called the schematic model. And the, what you see is, behavior that's qualitatively right, in the sense that you start out by a single step relaxation function, followed by uh, a sort of relaxation to a plateau, and then relaxation from the plateau, but eventually uh, beyond some uh, parameter values in this model, uh, you, you reach this plateau value, and then you do not decay, right? So in other words, density correlations become frozen at a finite value, right? And this <coughs> is then a transition where your relaxation time has diverged to infinity, okay? So you find this, um, but uh, it turns out that this divergence, I mean, there are lots of details which I'm skipping, but this divergence sort of happens at a temperature where you don't really expect it, right? Uh, so it, it, what, it, what this theory gets right is how you begin to approach this, this uh, limit of um, uh, diverging relaxation times, but then um, it, it, the relaxation times diverge too soon. Okay? Uh, what it, again, one thing that it does, uh, the functional form of the relaxation functions uh, you, you get, okay, though not uh, sort of, you get it uh, through numerical solutions, uh, etc. But, <clears throat> but basically you don't, um, you don't observe the full range of temperature dependence that is seen in real liquids, okay? The, the dynamical transition happens too soon, okay? And, and uh, uh, so, okay, this is not a, it's a, it's a use, but not a completely satisfactory theory of the glass transition. And, uh, you know, people have some understanding of why this is. One of the things uh, that is done in writing down this mode coupling equation is, uh, you know, I, I told you that we'd make this separation of fast and slow degrees of freedom, right? And it turns out that that separation doesn't really work very well, right? So what I consider to be fast degrees of freedom uh, have products of what I consider to be slow degrees of freedom, okay? And, and uh, then I end up with these kind of correlation functions where I have a product of uh, correlate or variables multiplied by another products, 
of variables. So normally I'm looking at things like this, but now I have, so this is a two point correlation, but I have now four, four point correlation functions and one doesn't really know how to deal with this uh, like in many situations. And so one does an approximation where you replace it by the square of two point correlation functions. So you factorize this four point correlation function and <clears throat> this is sort of a, a mean fieldish approximation, right? So people call this a mean field theory. Uh, there are other reasons. Um, and uh, it's sort of from this kind of an approximation, you might expect that this will not do a very good job of describing uh, heterogeneous dynamics because it was all about correlations between correlation functions, right? That's, that's how I described it earlier. Um, okay, I'm running seriously out of time. So, um, but anyway, so, but one, if I take this line that this is some, somehow mean field like, one might expect that if I were to now go to higher dimensional systems, this somehow becomes a better and better theory, right? And uh, this has been tested. And, and it turns out that <clears throat> that's, that expectation is not fulfilled, okay? And even worse, um, there's some spurious or pathological depending, you know, so the behavior at, in higher dimensional uh, uh, cases is actually uh, problematic, you get negative core values for the correlation functions, et cetera. <clears throat> know, which cannot, yeah, so I should emphasize. <clears throat> so any, well, yeah, thank you. Um, so if I look at the Van Hover function, it's by definition a positive quantity, whereas through uh, these uh, higher dimensional calculations, you find that this quantity comes out negative, which means that there's some problem with the theory, right? So that's sort of a status report at some point in time. Um, many more things have been attempted, such as trying to build in inhomogeneities, et cetera. Um, but uh, there are also attempts to sort of understand the origin of a mode, you know, a dynamical theory that's mode coupling like coming from thermodynamic descriptions. Okay. So all of that I'll leave to the other lecturers to elaborate on, but I, I'm just sort of giving you the background. Okay. But uh, in the same spirit, in the remaining time, I want to say a little bit about a thermodynamic approach to the problem, okay? Um, and to do that, I go back and show again uh, this slide about the Kausman paradox. And uh, so there's sort of two questions. The, so one question that I asked earlier uh, is whether this entropy vanishing uh, 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 by extrapolation, an indication of some kind of a thermodynamic transition. And that question remains. Uh, but I can also ask, is there a connection to dynamics? Okay. And, and uh, meaning this vanishing of the entropy or at least a reduction of the entropy, does it tell me something about the dynamics? Is there a way of understanding? And uh, so one answer uh, to that question uh, comes in the form of a relation called the Adam-Gibbs relation. And the basic idea is very, you know, I'll sketch it simply. Uh, what, so the first step in this uh, is Gibbs and DiMarzio developed the theory of the glass transition, which described the glass transition as a genuine second order thermodynamic transition at which the configurational entropy vanishes. Okay, uh, the status of that theory is you know, let's not uh, worry about. But based on that, they said, now, can we use this thermodynamic theory to understand dynamics? And they argued as follows. They said, let's imagine that at any given temperature, <clears throat> the liquid is composed of uh, what they call cooperatively rearranging regions. So there's some uh, region uh, of a given size such that if I take any subset of it, it cannot move. So this region needs to be a certain minimum size. 
in order for particles to move around. Huh? This was called the cooperatively rearranging region. So the whole liquid is made up of many of those. Yeah? <clears throat> and then you imagine that this size of the CRRs is increasing as you go to lower temperatures. Okay? That's, so this, this idea that there are cooperatively rearranging regions uh, is sort of a, a first time that the notion of a size or a length scale is sort of introduced in discussing the glass problem, and <clears throat> okay, and and you know its connection to entropy and so on uh, follows. Um, so then I say, if I have a, a size z for this cooperatively rearranging region, um, then in order for it to relax, in order for it to rearrange, uh, the probability is exponential in that size, okay? This I think, yeah, meaning the bigger this, uh, this CRR is, the less probable it is for it to rearrange, okay? Now, here, uh, again, is, is sort of the beginning of a, of a, 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 a you know, um, a way of thinking where you say that uh, there is this connection between a length scale, which is the size of these CRRs, and the time scale. Right? And more specifically, they make the connection that it is an activated dependence. So the bigger the size is, exponentially bigger is the relaxation time. Right? And uh, that's not, for example, how it comes out uh, in critical phenomena. Right? In critical phenomena, if I have a correlation length of a certain value, then the relaxation time is a power of that correlation function. Right? Here, the assumption is that it's exponential, right? And then this is sort of a relatively innocuous statement, uh, but you say that if I have uh, these minimum sizes required for particles to rearrange, right? The entropy content of that minimum size, I can think of as being a constant, right? Because, you know, crudely put, if I say that this the CRR has to be this big for it to change conformation. I can say, okay, you know, then there, it has a minimum of two structures at that size, right? So the entropy is log two, okay? And then I say, if the whole system is divided into these CRRs, okay, then the entropy content of the system is inversely proportional to the size of these regions, okay? And that's what I've written here. <laughs> okay, and uh, so then uh, this, of course, uh, probability uh, I can I can convert to a time scale, right? And I plug in the one over SC or for this Z here, and uh, what I end up with is this relationship between relaxation times and the entropy, which where it says. The relaxation time is the exponential of the inverse of the configurational entropy. Okay, and so this is again an activated uh, dependence, and uh, if the entropy gets lower and lower, the relaxation time shoot up correspondingly. Okay, and uh, this now has been sort of tested in various ways in simulations and in in, in experiments. And, and it seems to work uh, quite well. And I am really, mm, let me just sort of go through all of this. So the, the question is, how do you actually, at least in the simulations, OK, what is done in experiments is to uh, look at the excess entropy that we talked about earlier as this configurational entropy, right? But uh, what is? You know, but if I were to sort of ask, in principle, what should I be thinking of when I talk about the configurational entropy? I said it's, it's got to do with the multiplicity of states. What does that mean, right? So the, in the rest of the few minutes, I'll tell you a couple of different answers that one thinks about for that question, right? So one thing that I can say is at an intuitive level, I can say that, you know, if I were to look at the energy, interaction energy of a liquid uh, as a function of all its co coordinates, I could quite generally imagine 
that it has a very complicated shape, right? Which is characterized by many local minima. Okay, and uh, if I then say, I, I imagine that, or, or I say that, what I mean by a structure is either one or a small, a collection of a small number of these local minima, right? Then the entropy that I should compute is the entropy of the number of local minima that I have, okay? And uh, <clears throat> so these local minima are called inherent structures, and then the degeneracy of these inherent structures is what we call the configurational entry, okay? And uh, so this is sort of a cartoon picture. So this is, let's say, my overall face space, and, and I imagine that I've broken up this phase space into subvolumes where each color represents the basin of one of these structures. Okay? Then the total partition function of the system, I can write as a sum over each of these basins alpha, right? And this energy phi alpha will be the energy at the minimum, right? And then this partition function here will be over that volume, let's say the green volume. Uh, and uh, and then I have a Boltzmann weight where the interaction energy is defined with reference to that uh, minimum value. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> so this integral I can call the basin free energy, which is what it is, right? I'm integrating over the basin and I'm integrating a Boltzmann factor, so that gives me the exponential of a free energy, right? <clears throat> and this summation here involves uh, a degeneracy, phi alpha, so at any given, sorry, omega phi, <laughs> and so at any given energy omega uh, phi, I have a certain number of minima or basins, right? And then I can define the log of that to be the configurational entry, okay? So I end up with uh, an expression for the partition function which will be an integration over all the energies of the minima, uh, and, and the Boltzmann weight will have a basin-free energy and this configurational entropy. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so <laughs> then there are ways by which one can numerically in computer simulations uh, figure out how to, uh, how to calculate this, right? And a key step in, in doing so like I said, is A, to define what you mean by a basin, and B, uh, define how you're going to calculate, or more precisely, approximate the basin integral, okay? And uh, the simplest thing to do is to treat the basins as harmonic, and then you can sort of compute the basin integral easily, uh, but, um, and one can compute the basin free configurational entropy, and, uh, now, at this stage, <clears throat> you know, especially, okay, so if, if I were to just sort of say, I'm going to define some division of the configuration space, and I'm going to define the corresponding configurational entropy, then whatever you do is fine, right? But you're also trying to build a theory of glossy behavior, right? Which uh, involves some implicit notion that at some point, the relaxation uh, uh, of the system within each of these basins is going to be easy, and between them, it's going to become difficult and eventually impossible, right? That's number one. Um, <clears throat> and that transitions between these basins should somehow tell you something about the relaxation times and the viscosity, et cetera, okay? So if you say, these are my additional demands, if you don't have a dynamical theory, it's conceptually a priori difficult to know what is the right definition of a, a basin, okay? Um, so that, that is one problem. Um, in principle, even if I say basin for me means energy minimum, right, or the basin of a, an energy minimum, um, it's actually very difficult to compute it uh, properly, 
Uh, so some those of you who were here for Don Frankel's talk know that that, that was quite difficult, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, that leaves us uh, with the question, are there other ways of motivating what ought to be the correct definition of a basin? And are there other ways of uh, computing it? A little bit. I'll go, go over a little bit. Okay. And this is uh, what uh, Ludovic is going to be talking about. Um, ah. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me just take a little bit of time. Five is, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, uh, what shall I do? <laughs> no, but the clock says five minutes, so if you add five more... <laughs> no, no, let me go as long as... Okay, so... Um, what? Okay, so the, 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 the point is at this stage, we, we change attention to systems with quench disorder that have been studied, where there seem to be uh, somewhat more uh, precise answers to some of the same questions, right? So these are spin glass models. And uh, here is... Uh, oh, so you just want me to stop and do it as it? Okay, that's fine. Okay, I know, I, know what, I know what Patrick wants me to show. Here it is. Okay, we'll leave it there. <laughs> we'll come back. Yeah, this is nice. Okay.